I have the honor of inviting Mr. Rajendra Singh Pawar, Chairman and Co-Founder in IIT Group. He is the recipient of Padma Bhushan Award. His contribution to the development of India's IT industry have been widely acknowledged. May I now invite Mr. Pawar for his keynote speech on the past, present and future of EdTech. Over to you, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Neha. Uh, and once again, a very, very hearty welcome to all those who joined this session, which um, comes to you from the NIIT group, hosted, of course, by the university, but created and curated by many colleagues across the NIIT system. So I'd like to take a few minutes to set the context because you have an exceptional array of speakers. So the solutions and answers will come from them, but I thought it appropriate to set a bit of a context. And therefore I'll spend a few minutes talking about the past, a um, few more minutes talking about present, and then finally talking a bit about the future. So let me start talking about the past. And here I'm breaking this whole period uh, from NIT's inception, which was December 81, so practically 1982. And in the past, I want to touch this whole period, the, the first 25 years, going all the way to 2007. And this is the period where I would say, I would like to caption this period as the period of moving from tech education or tech ed to education through technology or ed tech. And the bulk of the early phase of this period, at least our preoccupation was with uh, doing technical education or education in technology. And um, for me personally, the journey began on 2nd of December, 1981, when Vijay Thadani and I, batchmates from IIT Delhi, uh, along with Shiv Nader, who was a chairman and founder, co-founder, we decided to embark on the journey of building talent for a sector which was just about getting born, the IT sector computer sector we called it then, but we use the word IT, National Institute of Information Technology, that's what NIT stands for. And um, we launched, interestingly, the, we launched the organization uh, with what we called as multimedia education. And multimedia then meant a uh, big video cassette recorder, VCR, and a color TV. That was for us multimedia with videos of learning, which we thought we would use in the classrooms. And of course, the overhead projector, which was then also part of the state of the art. And the terms that were beginning to come up all over the world were uh, computer assisted instruction, computer aided learning, and then moving gradually to computer based learning, computer based training. And I recall that even that time, interestingly, then the NCERT was dabbling with the area of introducing computer into education. And we had some great thinkers like Professor Jalaluddin at NCERT, who was pushing for computers in schools at that time. And I recall that uh, quite early on, we had got a huge gift as a country from Britain of a large number of computers called the BBC Micro, which was built by Acorn, a UK company. And interestingly, the BBC Micro was born, BBC Micro was born Around, just a day before NIT was on, 1st December 1981. And so the school system did a lot of interesting initiatives. And NIT started the whole training activity. And within that first decade, we had a large number of companies who had joined the bandwagon of creating a training industry. Since we had no internet, but we were found, finding a demand, we had found a very good niche. We had to expand and we did that by setting up centers, physical centers. And then when they were going too fast, we figured that we can't build a layer of a hierarchy of managers and lose the touch with the end learner. We conceptualized at NIT the idea of a franchising model where we had business partners. We never called them franchises, we called them business partners. Uh, started with nine, then went on to 30 and eventually in about 15 years, we had about 2,000 learning centers. So the scaling happened through physical distribution. And um, we were then also quite engaged and invited by the government to deal with the digital divide problem. 
So we had to start working with the state governments at that time. We conceptualized the model of build, operate, transfer for government schools. And at, at peak, we had 26,000 schools where government schools in villages and small towns where we were delivering the learning. But important milestone exactly 20 years after we started, 2nd December 2001, we launched our 20th anniversary by announcing what we call the World Computer Literacy Day. Um, and every year on that day, we would do something interesting to embrace a large number of people who were otherwise outside the net, including teachers, including mothers, including children who couldn't get access. And we dealt with uh, policymakers, parliamentarians. In fact, in parliament, we had ran a training program which where our, we had one of our students, a popular person called Mr. Lalu Yadav as well. And then we went to West Bengal in the legislative assembly. The chief minister told us that though they had thrown out computers many years ago, they wanted to educate the legislators and we ran a program for all legislators. And so did many others who got into the area. And by the end of this period, by now, we had started seeing that internet was coming in, inexpensive, inexpensive devices were coming in. And then from just using whatever technology we had to teach technology, we were all involved in using technology to teach other subjects. And that's the move from tech ed into ed tech, as I said. And that brings me to current period, which I want to talk about, which is the next 15 years. Uh, from 2007 to 2022. And I want to title this period of 15 years as MOOCs, I'll talk about that, to flukes, stray happen, happenings which created a huge opportunity. Finally, to nukes, what has really troubled our sector at this point in time. So let me talk about MOOCs very briefly. It's, it's just I'm going to touch very briefly. Many of you are familiar, but the term was coined by Canadian professors in 2008. And even before that, we had uh, the, the Khan Academy from 2007, where Salman Khan was making videotapes and putting it. And he was a brilliant teacher. And <clears throat> people were consuming that content. But there was no model for monetization. And then soon after that, we had three very significant MOOCs coming out called edX from which came from MIT and then Coursera and Udacity in the 2011 to 2012 period. And they were building content and pushing it online, uh, not just on video, but on interactive video. And the scaling of people getting onto these was humongous. It was, there was a recognition of the opportunity that everybody is coming online. There was a huge amount of excitement and a very big hype that this was the solution going forward. But then, as all of us know, uh, this was about teaching, delivering, not about learning. And we had severe problems of completion rates, which were down to a single digit, a small single digit. But the imagination that it's possible to use technology to reach everyone had come to a point where people were excited to find new methods. And then I talk about what happened in the last about four years. And I call it a, this period from then till 2022, where we are now as the period of flukes. And the flukes was what? The fluke was like it was a gold rush that everybody thought that there are 8 billion people on this planet and everybody has to learn. And the MOOCs have shown us that you can reach the learners. And now it's going to be possible that if you become more and more innovative, we can reach learners and perhaps solve the completion problem by being a little more interactive. And as we were beginning to learn that, a lot of money started coming to support this idea. And in addition to the huge upswing in the money that came in, and I just want to say that Financial year 19, $2.3 billion came into the Indian sector, which is working on EdTech. In the next year, it became 4.2 billion. And financial year 21, which ended March 20, it was 4.7 billion. So this was a huge increase 
which we look back at as, as a bubble, because right after this came COVID. And while COVID caused huge amount of problems for virtually most services sectors, but in education, COVID, there was no alternative to education except through getting online. And we would call it a perfect storm. We had tons of funding which had come in and learners had no option but to go online. And this flu created a massive demand, a massive perception of demand. And everybody thought this was the way to solve all the problems of the world. Except that we then quickly went into a stage which I am terming as nukes. So what was nukes? And the nukes are a combination of three things or two things which caused the third thing. First of all, the end of COVID, coming toward the end of COVID and getting back into the classroom. A lot of the demand which we thought was going to stay started vanishing. But this massive growth and the, the race to revenues and scale also created a lot of management and governance problem for many companies, people going head over shoulder. And that started creating a pushback from the marketplace. But And more recently, now I think there's going to be regulatory overreach because this massive run towards scale has created a situation of a lot of pushbacks. And I'll talk of that when I talk about the future because we have to recognize these pushbacks and deal with them. And these things led to the funding winter. And alongside, as you know, the economy worldwide going into a recession, the world is just escalating in, the war is escalating in the world. And all of that is making things bearish. But when we look at the funding winter, just a few data points, in quarter one of this financial year, the money that came into EdTech was 1.4 billion. Quarter two, it went down by 60% to 0 0.6 billion. And quarter three, it went down another 75% to 0 0.14 billion. So as we come to this phase of nukes with all the things hitting from all sides, it become absolutely critical for us to understand how do we go forward. And that brings me to the future, which starts, has started in a sense, or let's say starts in our conversation today. And I want to label this as a period of large opportunities still, irrespective of going from hype to whatever else, but the time to tread very carefully. Large opportunity, but time to tread very carefully. So I'll talk first about the opportunities that abound. But then about treading carefully, I want to talk of something that I call the quicksand and something that I call the minefields. And of course, I will also define this education problem with a colleague of mine, our CEO, Sapnesh, yesterday I was chatting with him and he told me about an analogy I'll talk about, the two miracle play, I'll talk about that. But for me, it's not here to, to, as an objective, to give you solutions. We have the whole afternoon where we have outstanding speakers who will touch upon the opportunities. That's where we want to stay and guide all of us who are getting into this field, have got into the field on how to deal with this large opportunity while trading carefully. So opportunities for a minute. Some data which has been thrown to us, at us all the time, which part of it still remains valid, that the global spend on education annually is more than $6 trillion. Does it mean we can access all of it? By no means, but that's the amount of activity in education. And I will hasten to say that this money is spent with an emphasis on teaching and very little emphasis on learning. And I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Another data point is that in about a month from now, the, the, the experts say that on 15 November this year, the world population will cross 8 billion. So we go from 7 billion, we've been speaking to 8 billion people on Earth. Also next year, India will become the most populated nation, will become bigger than China in population. 
And as this happens, we still have a very low literacy rate, many parts of the world. And uh, the GER in our country going is still less than a fourth. Large, large untapped opportunities, big problems to be solved. In addition to that, uh, many of us who are speaking today, some of us who are speaking, some are very young people, have had a working life which is going to be about 45 to 50 years. But many youngsters, many who are people in, coming in today know that they'll have a working life of 70 years. And people who are young students today, people say will live forever if science finds a solution. But anyway, working life is increasing, rate of change is increasing, and therefore, and technology solutions are emerging. So the rate of change is going to throw up the need for everyone to become a lifelong learner in a serious way. And so therefore opportunities abound. But now let's look at where we have to tread carefully. First, let me talk about what I call as a quicksand. So with this unlimited amount of money, which came into our sector, we lost the balance of recognizing that in a, is the business like ours, we have to have a gross margin and stabilize, have a path to a gross margin of 80% or more. And today, the customer acquisition cost is more than that. In fact, uh, when I talk of quicksand, many people say that to get one rupee of revenue, we are spending two rupees. And in some cases, it's going up to six rupees. This is what I term as a quicksand. Another analogy I want to give a hard analogy is that of being on a ventilator. When you don't have enough oxygen and you're put on a ventilator, you have the perception of being on oxygen. And we know what happens on a ventilator in most cases, that you keep increasing the oxygen. You have a perception of life you recognize that there's a point of no return. And so that's what happens in quicksand very often. So that's something we have to think about deeply, right from the stage of planning, that what is the runway to sustainability so that we're not going down and down, but we're going gradually. Going up. And then I want to touch upon the minefields. Um, so one thing which I want everyone who's involved in EdTech, because this is a session only for EdTech, it's not for startups in general. And within EdTechs, I think as we have clarified, uh, our expertise at the NIT system uh, is in the space of dealing with young adults moving from higher ed into their first job. That's what we've done for 41 years. And the second, of course, is once you're in your job and things are changing, we talked about that, there's an upgrading of skills that's required. So this is a space where we have the, the understanding and we want to share that understanding and we've got people who can help us share that. So now in this space, particularly higher ed, which is a bigger area, large number of people coming in and getting to the first job, the societal mindset is not in favor of education being for profit. In fact, each one of you, I can say, when you think about putting your child in school, you resent the way the fee goes up. It's your personal experience. You resent the way the colleges are charging more, even though schools and colleges are always in a deficit. So the societal mindset is not in favor of education for profit. And we've seen huge retaliation through government regulation. On this aspect, we've seen what happened in China. In the last two years, government stepped in and pretty much shut down many of the people who were using private equity money to do education, in a sense, not just supplementing learning, but trying to say we can replace it. And of course, there's now some revival, but it's gone down to much lower size than even before COVID. Uh, so that's the first minefield, which we have to be careful about that you stay away from issues which can get you into regulatory trouble. When you're thinking of the space you want to operate in, be very mindful that there's going to be an oversight of society in general and governments in particular. Governments are very protective about education in any country in the world. I've seen it in America, I've seen it in China, and I've seen it in 40 countries. 
every country, the Ministry of Education is protective about this area because it touches the thinking and mindset and culture of a country. So, so regulatory overreach when they see an overreach in profitability. Uh, this, then the thing is that we've had a huge amount of funds coming in. And um, it's important that we recognize that it can blind your sight from the necessity of being sustainable or building habits of sustainability, building habits of frugality. We understand everything, anything, anything that's happening in the field of education. And therefore, viability, even if it's coming a little down the line, has to be on the forefront all the time. And I, I want to give the analogy here, which is true for everything in business, is when you are, let's say, take the analogy of cricket and you're, doing, you're batting, you're batting at the crease. And you have the bowler on the other side. And somewhere on the side, you can see the scoreboard as well. Where should your eyes be? On the ball or the scoreboard? It's not surprising to see that whenever you're in a rush like this, your eyes always go to the scoreboard. And I'm sure many of our speakers are going to talk about the difference between looking at the ball, eyes on the ball and eyes on the scoreboard as value versus valuation. That's a huge mind feeling, intense pressure when you take money to be accountable to give returns to the extent that what is good for building a sustainable business gets forgotten and you get into the minefields. Regulation will come not just because we stray into education of the formal sector. Regu regulation will also come if there's misgovernance. And already, as you know, there's a lot of lumberings all the way in parliament about whether this sector has done an outreach and overreach and need to be regulated particularly when it starts violating either some governance norms or when it vi starts violating the space of formal education. The other minefield, so this is true for all those who are young, but for the very big ones as well, the minefield is that startups are bubbling in a positive way across the place. So you can be successful, but you can get disrupted very easily. So that's the constructive part of the minefield, but can be destructive if you're not careful uh, how to look after your space. So therefore, as I see, the future to me has huge amount of opportunity. We have learned a lot. And I think today's session is in many ways about learning those lessons. And I'm actually looking forward to listening to our speakers talking about this. But I did say I'll give another analogy that my colleague Sapnesh gave. And he was telling me he looks after a global operation at NIT Limited. And he was telling me that a few years ago, he was talking to someone in the winemaking industry. And that person told him that look, the winemaking industry is a two miracle play. You need two miracles to happen. He said, the first miracle is you have to make wine. You have to make good wine. Anybody can make wine. But the wine that suits the palate of the vast majority is an art form. It's been said again and again, and therefore the winemakers are artists of the highest order. They are also the psychologists of the highest order, and they have to be have to understand chemistry of the highest order. So the first miracle is to make the wine. Okay, now you get good, made very good wine, and it's getting some awards in many places. But the second miracle is to make money once you made the good wine. And for winemakers, they know how long it takes to build the trust in the, on the palate of the person who will try your creation. And Sapnesh drew a parallel with learning. And we have to reflect on why universities take decades to become popular. There are some exceptions, but they take decades. But education takes such a long time because, and I say this about branding and brand, brands are not the promise we make. 
It's a mistaken notion in marketing. Brands are the residue which is left after the transaction is over. The transaction has to be over. There has to be an exceptionally good experience. And then the person whose experience has to speak. Now, of course, social media is bringing the many years required to build the brand to a shorter period, but nonetheless, you've got to first make the wine and in learning, in education, the step number one is to remember we are not in the business of teaching. We are not in the business of delivering stuff. We are not here because we have technology which can deliver. We are in the space of learning. We are in the space of saying how does each learner who's absolutely individualistic as a learner we have that experience all of us how will that learner learn and very 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 little time i'm afraid is spent by most of our people in our industry on really getting down to the science of learning not the technology of delivery so the first magic or the miracle is to make learning happen and the second is to make money happen which means that you have to gross, have a group, path to a gross margin which is the excess of 80 percent and bring your cost of acquisition down from the 80 percent or more than it is now to 20 percent or less so i'm as curious as you are because all of us have to keep learning things are changing very fast and it itself is doing a new makeover in our in, in the learning that we've done with 2000 Learning Center, which we brought down to zero, or less, as we embark on digital learning. So with that, all the best to all who are here today. And I gather that Professor uh, Rajesh, who is the Vice Chancellor, is also putting together a process along with colleagues to see how some of the people who come today, we believe will be able to benefit by a more intense, shorter program. So with that, back to you, Neha. Thank you, sir, for your enlightening words.